There are very few genuine opportunities or experiences in the world that I would consider life-changing. Now, I've been so blessed to have a few, though, marrying my teenage sweetheart, and we're still married, and I'm still punching well above my weight, and witnessing the birth of our three children immediately spring to mind. And when it comes to travel, we've pretty near hit the mark on a few occasions, but the bullseye has evaded us so far, until now. When Silver Sea invited us to the Galapagos Islands, we looked at each other with a little bit of disbelief and mild apprehension. The unsavoury thoughts of four flights and 29-ish hours travel were quickly overcome by delicious thoughts of swimming with hammerhead sharks, sitting on park benches with sea lions, and sharing a fresh green salad with a giant tortoise. But would it really be like that? Would it really live up to the ludicrous and overwhelmingly positive reviews and unrealistically idyllic documentaries bordering on fantasy we'd been saturating ourselves in the lead up to our seven night cruise? Well, let us take you on our journey into this phenomenal world of magical tame creatures and ethereal Martian esque landscapes. Let us show you why this Silver Sea voyage is no ordinary holiday but a truly life changing experience. So welcome, this is our Galapagos story. The first part of our expedition was two nights in Quito, the capital of Ecuador. Squished into a valley between the Andes ranges at around 9,000 feet above sea level, we were warned this city, the second highest capital in the world, could repay your enthusiasm with a decent dose of altitude sickness. The hotel included in the Silver Sea package, the JW Marriott, was absolutely gorgeous and fitted well into the Six Star Company's ethos of ultra luxury. A slab of modern architecture nestled in the heart of this ancient city, it is huge, spacious and airy. The rooms don't scrimp either. A look at ours on the seventh floor overlooking the pool and you'll soon realise that swinging a large Amazonian Jaguar wouldn't be a problem in here. Our luggage, incidentally, was still in Amsterdam at this point. It's a long story and too traumatic to recall here, so please read our blog for the full gory details. So with only the clothes we travelled in and slightly conscious that we might pong a bit, we headed downstairs for some Ecuadorian cuisine in one of the hotel's restaurants. The food was fabulous. This potato soup was a traditional Ecuadorian dish and was recommended by the Silver Sea rep on the way back from the airport. It was so simple but utterly delicious and I could have eaten it for breakfast, lunch and dinner the next day. After our meal, smelly and tired, we headed to bed, praying for our luggage to arrive before we flew out to the islands. If it didn't arrive tomorrow, we'd be in a sticky situation. Ugh. After waking up, alert and refreshed at 1am, our bodies thinking it was 7am, we had to wait a while for breakfast. But breakfast was worth the wait. It was a lavish Ecuadorian affair, so to sample yet more of the local grub was a real pleasure. After all, you don't come all this way and insist on a full English, do you? The fresh smoothie bar gave us something to slurp on as we took a look around the hotel before heading out. And where would we go on our only full day in Quito? There was only one place we could go, and no, it wasn't the shops. Although we were increasingly tempted to buy some emergency clothes in case KLM had sold our belongings on eBay. (music) 
The primary spoken language in Ecuador is Spanish, and Ecuador literally means equator in Spanish. So you can't come to Quito without visiting the intersection on the earth where the north meets the south, only 26 kilometers to the north of the city. It would be like going to Paris and saying, nah, I think I'll skip the Eiffel Tower. And we had three points of interest on this tour. The first was to pop into the Pululahua Volcano and Geobotanical Reserve. I think I pronounced that right. To see the second largest volcano crater in the world. So large, in fact, People live in it and farm the land within, the only crater on earth with inhabitants. Then, a few minutes in the coach later, we got to the Theodad Mitad del Mundo, or middle of the world, where there's a large park with a giant monument topped with a polished stone globe constructed by the Ecuadorian government on the equator line. And is where in 1736, French explorers calculated where the equator was using only a ball of string, a telescope, and a guinea pig sandwich, probably. After all, this was the time where most people thought the Earth was flat, riding on the back of four elephants, standing on top of a giant sea turtle. Oh, but wait! Viewers, hold back your awe. Ladies, cease your posing. For this isn't the actual equator. This lies a few hundred yards up the road at the Intinan Museum. Or Intinan, I don't know. This is where the GPS reads True Zero, as confirmed by some pretty meaty American military satellites, and almost by my Google Maps app on my phone here. Given those 18th century explorers had no tech at the time other than a ball of string and a key eye for the stars, it's an absolute wonder they got so close to the real zero degrees. I'd have taken my hat off to them, but for the fact it was so damn hot. And hot it was, because here we were closer to the sun than any other point on Earth. To stand on the actual equator felt quite triumphant. More so than standing on the Greenwich Prime Meridian Line in London, which separates east from west. Which incidentally, being marked out in 1851, is also in the wrong place by 102 metres. But now we've done both, and at least this one was correct, so that's very satisfying. After the photo opportunities, our guide commenced with demonstrating all those little tricks they play on you. Like the water demonstration, which shows water going down a plug hole clockwise only a couple of metres north, anti-clockwise a couple of metres south, and straight down the plug hole right in the equator. Most locals will tell you this is a sleight of hand trick and not true, but I've got to admit it was quite convincing. What do you think? Real or fake? Look at the footage carefully and leave a comment below. Also, apparently you can't walk in a straight line with your eyes shut without falling over on the line. You can also, rather randomly, balance an egg on a nail, which you can't do anywhere else on Earth apparently, although I don't know why you'd think to do this anywhere else on Earth anyway. And strength is also adversely affected on the line, but to be honest, it all got a bit ridiculous. And I'm such a doubting Thomas. Thankfully that evening our cases arrived and our sweaty smelly bodies thanked the Lord of Air Travel for providing some fresh and appropriate clothes for the next day. When we're going to need them. You can't wear a hoodie in the Galapagos. Now, you might be thinking, this is a cruise channel. Where's the ships? Well, it was necessary to show you what we've just shown you as your seven night cruise on the Silver Galapagos includes a two night stay in Quito beforehand. It would have been wrong to leave it out as it's part of the expedition. And we had an early flight to the islands and it stopped at Guayaquil, Ecuador's largest city, on the way to pick up and drop off passengers. As Quito is 9,000 feet above sea level, and Guayaquil is, by the coast, 25 minutes by air to the south, it was almost a case of taking off, then immediately descending to land. A strange little flight through the Andes Mountains, but very picturesque. The flight from Guayaquil to Boltra is about 1 hour 45 minutes long, as the islands are about a thousand kilometers into the Pacific Ocean, almost dead easterly along the equator. 
And getting there may be a little unusual, but the lengths the Ecuadorian government go to ensure the islands remain as uncontaminated by mainland humanity is even more extraordinary. Firstly, you need this permit that costs 20 US dollars each, which serves no other purpose than ridding you of 20 US dollars. You can't get in without one though. Secondly, upon arrival, you have to pay a $200 park fee per person. Yes, $200 US dollars per person. Otherwise, you'll never make it out of the airport. Luckily, this is all included in your Silver Sea fare. Thirdly, they get you to fill in this declaration, where you have to fess up about what you're bringing with you. Food, seeds, nuts, plants, animals, in fact, most things are not allowed and will be confiscated before you leave the airport. Why? Well, to try and minimise the outside interference of the island's unique and indigenous ecosystem. Invasive species can arrive on the bottom of your shoes, on the velcro of your rain jacket, in the dirt on your camping equipment. You'd be amazed. Prior to landing, they even fumigate the plane by spraying some sort of insecticide into the cabin and baggage areas. No nasty bugs are going to land on this island. But it's not over yet. Once your baggage has been offloaded, it is laid out in this room and we all had to stand behind a line while the authorities used sniffer dogs to check over the luggage for anything food related that might be in there. I can only hope the poor dog wasn't too offended by our clothes we spent two hot sticky days in. Ugh. Well, with all that over with, we could at last look forward to embarking. And unfortunately, with our first glimpse of the Silver Galapagos, we're going to have to leave it there until part two. I know, it's disappointing to make it all the way through this first part, patiently waiting for some actual ship footage, only to be denied the prize right at the end. But thank you for watching. There's some incredible experiences to share from our Silver Sea Galapagos expedition, and it feels like we've not even started, so please consider subscribing and be the first to see it all very soon. Thank you.